Okay, good. Great, yeah. Great to be here. So I'll be telling you a little, uh, a little bit about our recent work we've been doing on using random projections for probabilistic inference. And I want to start by giving you uh, an idea of the kind of problems that we can use, that we can use these techniques on. <coughs> a little bit of motivation. So we've seen that in the past uh, few years, AI has made a lot of progress in a lot of uh, exciting application domains. Uh, we've built things like uh, the Watson system, We've made a lot of progress in speech recognition, things like machine translation. You know, think about the Skype. Uh, nowadays, you know, you can speak to it. It can recognize your voice, translate into a different language, and synthesize the voice at the other end. Uh, image classification, and think about AlphaGo. You know, this this system it built handle, by. It can handle Israeli accents by now. Really? Wow, that's pretty good. It does Italian pretty well. My wife can speak to my parents in Italy, and they more or less can speak to each other. Many years and couldn't do it. <laughs> and uh, AlphaGo is also, you know, it managed to beat the, one of the leading uh, Go players uh, a few months ago. So lots of, lots of successes. And one of the key techniques that sort of were used to build these systems is uh, supervised learning. So this idea that uh, in order to build these complex systems, one uh, possible approach is to try to train a machine to solve this task by providing a lot of examples on how to, to solve it. So for example, if you want to do image classification, what we can do is we can take a complex model, like maybe a neural network. We can show it a lot of examples of images with the corresponding labels, like showing images of dogs, cats, uh, honey badgers. And then by checking what kind of predictions the machine does, the, the model does, we can sort of back propagate errors. We can fine tune the ways so that the, the, the system gets better and better. And eventually, we can develop the state of the art systems that work very well in practice. And uh, there has been three major trends that made all these recent successes possible. Uh, the first one is that uh, the use of these very complex uh, and high capacity models, like deep neural networks, the second one is uh, just the improvements in hardware that made training these models possible. But the third one was really the availabilities of very large labeled training data sets. So for example, ImageNet, it's a huge collection of labeled images, like millions of images. You see here some examples. Uh, and it's really crucial to have this kind of uh, uh, training data in order to train these systems because you know, there is a lot of variability in images. You can see there are all sorts of things that can change even within a, the same class. And so in order to train a system to, to be robust and to work well in practice, you really need to provide a lot of labeled examples to, to make the system work well in practice. And the challenge, of course, is that labeling is expensive. Uh, it took a lot of effort to collect these kind of data sets. And so, and, and the key question is whether there, is, there are ways in which we can use unlabeled data. Say, you know, maybe you have one of these recent data sets, like several hundred thousand photos of celebrities. But let's assume that we don't have any labels about them. Like, we don't know who these people are. We don't know anything about what's actually in the picture. We don't know. We cannot ask humans to label for us whether people have glasses or not, uh, what kind of eye color, what kind of hair color, or gender, or anything. So is there something that we can do uh, using these kind of unlabeled data sets? And uh, one uh, natural thing to do is to try to construct a model that essentially discovers the structure in the data. And one such model would be try to construct a probability distribution over images that uh, essentially captures the structure in these images that we can use to, to train it. So a probability distribution over images that puts high probability on images that look like uh, uh, human faces of celebrity faces. And why is this useful? Well, if you have such a model, then you can do all sort of interesting tasks. You can, for example, uh, do unsupervised feature learning. So you might be able to discover features automatically that then you can use later on to do supervised classification tasks. Or you, know, you can do other kind of probabilistic reasoning tasks, like re remove noise from images. You can uh, complete mi missing part in images. You can improve the resolution. There are all sort of interesting things that you can do if you can construct uh, such a model. So a probability distribution that, such that if you sample from this probability distribution, you're going to get images that look like, uh, say, human faces. So how can we uh, do this? Well, one natural way to do it is to consider a latent variable, mo latent variable model. We have seen this uh, uh, in the talks yesterday on probabilistic programming. 
this idea that we can view computer vision as the inverse uh, procedure of, of computer graphics. So the idea is that we're going to have uh, a model with two types of variables. There's going to be some variables that we observe, and these are the images, so pixels. And uh, we assume that there's going to be some latent variables, some that capture essentially all the factors of variations that can happen in an image. And these are things we don't get to see because they are the images that we have access to are not labeled. And just as a toy example, we might have things like maybe the ethnicity of the person, which then my affect is eye color, the hair color, the pose of the person, the gender. And so if you had all these hidden features of the, of the image, then it would be relatively straightforward, or, or easier at least, to actually generate an image that uh, satisfies these this kind of conditions. Where do these variables come from? So in this, this is like a toy model. Uh, you know, you, the kind of techniques that I'm going to uh, show are we're not going to actually put a semantic meaning on the, on the variables. So we're just going to say there is some latent structure that we're going to capture using some latent variables, and we're going to try to discover it. So that's a way to get model flexibility. There are some ways in which you can try to sort of put a semantic meaning, like you can, if you have some labels. Like you can try to sort of, for example, try to have high mutual information between some of your hidden variables and some label that you have. Like say if you have a small number of images where you have labeled the, uh, the hair color or something, then you can try to do it. But for now, we're just going to assume that we're going to try to discover the structure automatically. So how well can this work? So let me show you some examples. These are some images. Uh, and. Uh, that you can get with, with, with this kind of system. How many of you think that the images in the first row are actually generated from a model or actually are real? How many think that images in the first row are real? Okay. Turns out that they are actually generated by a model. Uh, the actual images uh, were these ones. Say again, flip again. Yep. So these are, so you can see now the images in the first slide are actually generated from a model. These are samples. So you basically draw some uh, random variables based on some probability, based on this probability distribution. So you sample the z variables, and then you sample the x condition on the, on the z, and you get images that look like that. And these are the actual true images. So you can see. It's doing a pretty good job, I think. Like it's almost as good that it can actually fool humans. It does make some mistakes. You see, like this one, for example, has some strange thing on the forehead that the actual person doesn't have. This is not perfect. Yeah. So, so, so what does that mean? I mean, you can have a model that just memorizes training data, and then you know maybe adds, changes color or something like that. Like so. so. Great question. Yeah, I, I get to that in the next slide. Yeah, I'll show you exactly how I'm generating these. And so I'll get to that question. It's put in the same spirit, so. OK, good. So you can see it's doing a pretty good job. Now, how am I actually doing this? So the way I'm doing it is I'm actually doing an in-painting task. So what I'm doing is I'm providing the model a piece of an actual image. Like in this case, I'm providing the eyes of the person. And then I'm asking the model, complete the image. So for example, if I give the model these eyes, one of these two is the actual person corresponding to those eyes. The other one is the one generated by the model. And they are different. They actually, even the gender is different. This looks like a female, I guess. This looks like a male. Can you guess which one is true, which one is generated by the model? Maybe the bottom is true. Bottom is true, yeah. But it, it's still reasonable, I think. It's doing a decent job at generating a, an image. So does that answer your question, sort of, in terms of the, the variation? I mean, so, because you can imagine something that basically just stored the training data, took that, looked up, you know, which, which, which it's, image I've seen and close to that, and just output that. Yeah, so it's on, it's, on, it's on a test set. So it's a separate uh, set of this. It has, the model has not seen these pieces of the images before. But it might have seen the same person, because I think the same, uh, it's 
a data set of celebrities. So I think there are multiple photos of the same celebrity. So it might have seen it from a different angle. But sorry, that, it didn't remember, like it's sort of coming up with new stuff. You can see here, it's coming up with a female face instead of a male face. But the fact that, it, that somehow the two images and the random images are so similar, I mean, that kind of puzzles me. I don't quite understand how you generate even what parameters can you get, you, you know, you know, a, you, you know, European 50-year-old man. Even if you fix the eye, there are so many variations that I can't understand how you get uh, with so many, so few variables. So I don't, the same image. oh, I'm not using those variables. That was a toy model. That's not the actual model I'm using. So this is not, this is just to give up an idea of how the model, this idea of using latent variables versus uh, observed variables. With enough latent variables, then it becomes, I mean, what is it, latent variable now? With enough latent variable, you capture the pixels, right? Like well, variable per pixel. You could, but then it's not going to work well on a new on data piece of an image that you haven't seen before. So I could memorize all the training images, but then how is it going to do anything meaningful on a new image? Yeah? Just to be clear, there's two piles of images. Yeah. The computer sees pile A for a while, it does what it does. Then from pile B, you pick an image, you crop it, yep. you show it to the computer, and the computer has to fill out the rest of the yep. picture. That's the task. So the rest is synthetic, basically. What we see around these eyes yeah. is synthetic. It's synthetic based on a probability distribution that we're going to try to train. Yeah. Is it, would it have been possible to have the test set have a distinct set of humans? Maybe. maybe. I don't know if it has the labels, maybe. That would be interesting, actually, because it's possible that it maybe has seen the same person. And, mm -hmm. Though it's hard, I guess. I'm yeah. still confused by a detail. When, I, when you showed us the real images and the <coughs> synthetic ones, they seem to be matched in the same positions. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, is this, is this I did it on purpose so that you can actually compare them. But when you randomly generate a mini image, how can I find out, uh, how can I generate one with a hat, for example, and, and with the same color as the one that you had? So I only give it the eyes. So it's, you see, like, this one is generating a female, and this one is generating a male. No, I, I'm still stuck with the three slides earlier, when you, when you showed us here the images, um, uh, the, the many images. Uh -huh. Yes, and you had uh, the same, the same um, magenta hat, or blue hat. It's probably in the eyes. It's the eyes. See? That's why it can complete it. I see. So for those kind of eyes, it's going to generate a hat. Well, it's seen, it has seen that there is a hat there. And so it figured out that I should probably complete it. And it, well, the, image, the actual image is like this. It didn't great, do a great job. It looks more like a swimming kind of <laughs> thing. But yeah. Looking at the next slide, Yeah. the one after that. Yeah. So in this example, is it fair to say that the computer knows that under the nose, there should be a mouth? Yeah, that I think is. It puts a generic mouth on the top synthetic sample, and there's a photorealistic mouth. Sort of, yeah. I think that it's hard to say what exactly it's doing, but that's probably it has figured out that there is a relationship it's between eyes. It's that there has to be a mouth underneath the nose. Yes, yes, yes. So it synthesized the mouth. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I guess another way to understand how much uh, it's memorizing versus generating is if you give it the same set of eyes and run it. 100 times, what, how much diversity do you get? There is some variation, yeah. Uh, I don't have them here, unfortunately, but maybe I can show you what happened. But this is just to motivate. Uh, I can show a different example where it doesn't work as well. Here I'm showing it parts of a bedroom, and I'm asking it to complete the image of the bedroom. So these are the seeds. So you show it a piece of a bed or something. And you can see this is the true image that we, I cropped it out from. And the samples are a little bit more. This one is a harder problem, I think. Are you see, have less geometric structure than faces. Yes, it's like there is much more variety. <laughs> like you see, <laughs> the bed up here, I think it's com it didn't do a great job at doing that. And there are some strange things about where it places windows and curtains, but it's still doing reasonably well. And but again, this was just to motivate. Uh, how do we actually train these models? Uh, the challenge here is that uh, we only get to see the images. We don't get to see all the values for these latent variables. So one way in which these models are trained is that uh, while well, you have a very complex model with tons of parameters, and then uh, what you're going to do is you're going to try to find the parameters that maximize the likelihood 
of the training set uh, for those parameters. So mathematically, what we have is we have the x. We have a, probability, a joint probability distribution between the visible variables and the hidden ones, uh, which factors in a nice way because there is this kind of uh, generative process where you first sample the latent variables and then the visible ones. And the goal is that going to be that of maximizing the, the marginal likelihood of the data when you marginalize out all these hidden variables that we don't know the value of. So if you want to spell it out completely, we have to basically maximize over the parameters of the model the log marginal likelihood of each example, where you have to sum out all these factors of variations that we don't know anything about. And uh, the challenge is that computing these kind of expectations is very expensive. Uh, we have seen it in some of the talks before. It effectively corresponds to computing a very high dimensional integral. And so how these models are actually trained in practice is typically using a uh, variational approximation, where the basic idea is that we're going to use a tractable proxy for this intractable uh, marginal likelihood. So the, the, the math is fairly simple. We start with the marginal likelihood here. We multiply and divide by some probability distribution q, which can be anything. It just has to be uh, non-zero. And then what we do is we just apply Jensen's inequality to bring the logarithm inside the sum. And we get a lower bound that way. Why do we want to do this? Because we're going to choose q to be simple. And if q is simple, then this is an integral with respect to q. And so that's something that we can actually evaluate efficiently if we are careful about how we choose q. So the picture is something like this. There is the true marginal likelihood of the data as a function of the parameters. That's hard to compute. We cannot do it. So instead, we're going to look at a lower bound, which is given by that Jensen's inequality. And of course, the, the question that you, that you should probably thinking about is that uh, how good is this lower bound? Like I've shown you before that no matter how you choose Q, you're going to get a lower bound. But how good is this, is this lower bound? Like how close is this red curve to the, to the black curve? Because ultimately, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to optimize the red curve, hoping that we're going to get that we are also going to optimize the black curve. But we don't really know that unless we know that these two curves are close to each other. <coughs> It turns out that you can work out how tight this bound is. And it basically depends on how far your approximating distribution q is from the true posterior distribution over the hidden variables given the observed ones. So you're going to get that the lower bound that we're actually going to optimize that red curve that I had before is equal to the true thing, but then there is another piece that we uh, that depends on basically on how well we're, we can choose Q. So the game then becomes trying to choose Q so that that bounds gets becomes as good as possible. So we know that if we choose Q to be the actual posterior over Z given X then the bounds become tight. And you can sort of see it. If you plug it in here, this quantity becomes a constant. So you can factor it out, and things work out. Uh, the question is that we want q to be simple so that we can evaluate that lower bound. And so sometimes you just cannot do it. Say, if p, the posterior, is maybe a mixture of two Gaussians, showing here in blue, and your tractable distributions are, say, Gaussian distributions, where you have like a single mode, you might not be able to describe that complex object just using a Gaussian. Maybe the best you can do is to pick one of the modes and cover that, but that's it. You, can, you just cannot do better because your approximating distribution is just too simple. Questions? Yeah. So the, uh, the posterior was dependent on x. Yes. So 
how much can you expect them to? It work? should be dependent on X. I was just sort of hiding okay, the, the so notation. You but you pick Qs depending on the ideally, you should do that. In practice, you typically amortize and you come up with ways to make it faster in practice. But in theory, you should be dependent on X. Yes. So this is basically the whole idea behind variational inference. The idea is that you have some complex intractable probability distribution that you care about, like the posterior distribution over the hidden variables given the visible ones. You have a family of simple distributions. And what you try to do is you try to find a simple, you try to find a simple distribution in this set that is as close as possible to P, where here close is KL divergence. <laughs> L-projection or I-projection? It's it? an I-projection. This is called, in information theory, it's called an I-projection, information projection. Because you're, but it's not really a projection. This is not really a metric because it's, it's not symmetric. But they, they, they call it I-projection. Uh, so that's why it's called variational inference, because it's an optimization problem over functions. You're sort of, you have a space of probability distribution, and you're trying to optimize over that to minimize this distance, which is not really a distance, between the best approximation and P. You're saying it's not a distance because it's not symmetric? It's not symmetric. K not symmetric, yeah. So we're trying to find a tractable distribution that is as close as possible to P. The challenge is that, as we've seen before, basically, in general, you cannot get any kind of bounds on how far that optimal approximation is from P. Because basically, if Q is too simple with respect to P, like P is bimodal and Q has, is unimodal, you just cannot do much. This is like a standard problem of all the variational inference methods, which you know, there are hundreds of papers, uh, probably more. It's a very, very powerful technique that comes from statistical physics that has been used heavily in, in computer science, statistics, and machine learning. So what I will show you today, hopefully I have time to go over it, is a way to improve our variational inference methods by using random projections. So the idea is that what we're going to do is, at a high level, what we're going to do is we're going to start with our complex intractable model. We're going to randomly project it in a way that somehow preserves the properties of P. And then, uh, but simplifies P so that Intuitively, the projection P prime becomes closer to Q, and so we can get a better, it's easier to approximate. And then what we do is we take an I projection of the random projection of P. And because P prime is simpler, this approximation you can show that becomes good in some sense. And because this random projection does not lose too much information, you can basically recover the properties of P with high probability. Questions? You have no bound on the quality of the I projection. In general. In this case, you do? You, go, you do get a bound on the quality of the I After the random projection, yes. A suitably chosen random projection. This is a little bit in, just the intuition, but that's sort of the, the idea. The idea is that. If it's too complex, we're going to project it, simplify it to the point where we can approximate it well without losing too much information. So it's the standard sort of XOR thing that we're going to do at the end of the day. But that's, that's, that's the plan. And what about the approximation between P and P prime? Okay. That is something that we can control because the random projection is chosen in a way that it preserves the information. So if you know something about P prime, then you can recover the properties of P, more or less. Yeah. Does the random projection depend on either P or the family of distributions? It, it, this only, so it does not depend on P, but it only works if Q is sufficiently, there is a technical condition on Q. It has to contain all the degenerate distributions. But it's oblivious. It's oblivious. So, the picture would be something like this. Before we were optimizing this lower bound that was potentially arbitrarily bad. <coughs> the black curve is the thing we actually care about. So what we want to get is we want to get some kind of envelope around the black line that we can control. 
and we want to get some new estimate, which will be stochastic, but it's sort of guaranteed to be relatively close to the black line, which is the one we care about. So if we optimize for the green line, we're guaranteed that we're going to do not, we're pretty much doing the right thing because we are, we are fairly close to the black line, which is the one we care about. The black line, remember, that's the, mar the true marginal likelihood of the data when you integrate out all the latent factors of variation. Questions before we move on to the random projections? All right. So how do we do the, these random projections? So let's go back to the original problem of computing uh, marginal probability. So as before, we are given some kind of probability distribution over, let's say, two types of variables, some visible, some hidden. Our goal is to marginalize out all the hidden variables. So I'm just going to forget about the x for now. I'm just going to call this quantity w. It's just going to be a weight uh, that, that we want to sum out, basically. So let's say that if we have two factors of variation, the gender and the pose, and they can be binary, and this is an easy thing. There are only like four possible assignments. Each one will get a non-negative weight uh, given by this probability. And so you just want to sum up four numbers. That's easy. And then, of course, the catch is that if you have maybe 100 latent variables, this becomes uh, defines a sum over a huge number of terms. And so this is generally intractable to compute. So to explain how this works, let me make the simplifying assumption that w is either 0 or 1. It, the problem is still hard, but it's a little bit easier to explain. This goes back to the model counting that Moshe was talking about yesterday, if you were here. So let me explain how the problem works by looking at an, an analogy. So if the weight function is either 0 or 1, what we want to do is we basically want to count the number of configurations of possible assignments to the z variables that have weight 1. So instead of looking at that problem, we're going to think about an analogous problem where we want to count the number of people in an auditorium. And the auditorium has some structure, like it's divided into rows and columns. Many seats are empty. Some seats are full, but the distribution is very uneven, like people tend to sit on the back. And our goal is going to be that of computing the total number of people in the room. So the analogy, of course, is that auditorium is the search space, the space of all possible assignments. The seat, each seat corresponds to an assignment to these hidden variables. And the occupied seats correspond to assignments with non-zero weight. So how can you do it? How can you count the number of people in the auditorium? One approach is, of course, to do just brute force. You just go through every seat, and you increment a counter if the seat is occupied. It's simple. It's exact, but of course, it does not scale. If you have a big space with 100 latent variables, you're never going to be able to do it this way. Uh, a better approach is to try to exploit the structure of the space. So you can try to sort of maybe divide the space uh, by in sections and then recursively count the number of people in each section. So maybe we divide it that way first, uh, and then we recursively count each half. And the trick here is that we can use some smart heuristics for detecting the entire sections that are either completely full or completely empty. So this is a lot faster than brute force. It's still exact, but it's sort of still not scalable because you're still accounting for every single uh, full seat in the auditorium. So what about approximate counting? The naive approach is to do sampling. The idea is, instead of looking at the whole auditorium, what we're going to do is we're going to take a small section, we're going to count the number of people in that section, and then we're going to scale it up by a factor of six. Because there are six sections, we just pick one, count the people, and multiply by six. Which is fast, as long as that section is small. But as you can imagine, it can be wildly inaccurate. Like, if there are only very few non-empty seats in the auditorium, your chances of actually getting uh, one of them in your small sample is going to be extremely small. And so this estimator can have a huge variance. It's not going to work in practice. So let's try something. Yeah. Are you making some assumptions on uh, 
on the fraction of seats? Uh, I'm not. So it could be very small, it could be very large. You don't assume it's at least 1% or something? No. That otherwise would be easy. Yeah, yeah, that would be easy. If there is a list, yeah, that would be easy. But it could be exponentially smaller. So, so let's try something different. Let's try something uh, distributed coin flipping strategy. So the idea is like this. We're going to try to count the people in the room. So we're going to start by asking everybody to raise their hand. And then we're going to go through a protocol that works like this. We're going to have everybody flip a coin. And then if it's, it comes up heads, then maybe you keep your hand up. And if it comes up tails, then you bring your, head, your hand down. Forever. Forever. You down forever. You down forever. Yes. And then uh, we can keep repeating this until we are left to the point where you know, nobody has his hand up at the end. And as you can, and then what we're going to return as your count for the number of people, we're going to re return two to the number of rounds that we did this process. And as you can imagine, does this work? Well, on average, you can sort of see why this works. Because on average, half of the people will lower their hand at every round. So if there were n people to begin with, it will roughly take you log 2m rounds to get to the point where nobody has their hands up. So roughly speaking, it works. Now, the challenge is, of course, how to make this intuitive idea concrete and actually get an algorithm and get the guarantees. So the first challenge is how to get configurations to flip coins and how to get the guarantees. And this is the same as the, so the, the idea is the same as what Moshe was describing yesterday. If you were here, it's based on the original theoretical work in, in the complexity theory literature. And there are a number of sort of implementations of this idea and different analysis. The basic building block is to use parity constraints to get to implement this coin flipping strategy. So the idea is that we have a bunch of variables, like 10 in this case. And what we're going to do is we're going to generate random parity constraints by adding each variable with probability 1 half. So maybe we add variable x1, we add x3, x4, x7, x10. And then we randomly pick a parity, uh, like a, left, a right hand side for this parity equation. And then uh, it turns out that if you generate a parity constraint like this, each uh, configuration will satisfy this parity constraint with probability one half. So the probability one half, it will lower their hand. And it has pairwise independence. So if you take any two configurations, A and B, the events A satisfy X and B satisfy X are independent, which is useful to get sort of statistical guarantees on the approach. So the effect is like this. You start maybe with 50 non-empty or, or sort of non-zero weight uh, assignment. You add a parity constraint, about half of them disappear. Then you add another one, and half disappear, another one, another one, another one, until you're left with, uh, say, a unique solution or no solutions. And then you return two to the number of rounds that it took you to, to get to that point. Now, remember that what we wanted to do is to do it for weighted problems. We had this probability distribution. It's not just 0, 1. It turns out that a very similar approach works, also in that case. What you do is you still add parity constraints. But instead of checking at every round whether there is still somebody with their hands up, whether still somebody survives, what you do is you find the assignment with the highest weight. So you find the mode of the distribution that you're left with after you add the parity constraint, which is sort of the if the weights are all 0, 1. It's, it's a very difficult problem. Sorry? It's a very difficult problem. It's a very difficult problem, yeah. It's an optimization problem that can be, that can be hard. It's it, potentially easier than counting, but it's still uh, potentially a hard problem. It's a combinatorial optimization problem. And, uh, but by repeating this procedure a uh, certain number of times, you are able to deduct something about the, the model count by the total weight, which is what we wanted to compute. Well, the picture is like this. Uh, 
we start with a function here that we want to integrate, basically. What you do is you first find the mode of this function. Then you add one random parity constraint that will basically throw away half of the configurations. And you find the mode of what's left. You repeat this process a small number of times, finding the mode at each iteration. And then you compute some statistic of that, in this case, the median. Then you do the same thing with two parity constraints. So you sparsify the state space even more. And uh, you repeat it a bunch of times. And you aggregate, taking a median. And you repeat this for different number of constraints. And then uh, at the end, you scale up things appropriately. And it turns out that this will be uh, the final estimate for the total weight. What is n here? What is n? n? n is the number of variables. That could be up to 2 to the n, sort of possible. So, so it turns out that you can prove some uh, strong guarantees on the accuracy of this algorithm. It will compute a constant factor approximation to the total weight, and it requires solving a relatively small number of optimization problems. And you can get down to sort of like a 1 plus epsilon approximation by adding more variables, or there are other tricks to, to do that if you, if you want that. But for now, uh, that's just, uh, just building up to our original problem of trying to combine random projections with live projections. The idea is that we're going to think of these random parity constraints as some kind of random projection that we can apply to these complex objects that are probability distributions. So we start with some probability distribution that looks like this. And then we add this parity constraint, this randomness, this random perturbation, if you wish. And then we get a new probability distribution that is, in some sense, simpler. Because of the properties, because of pairwise independence, and because this is a universal hash function, in some sense, you, you, this, pro, this projection preserves a lot of the information. As we have seen before, in some sense, by, you, you don't lose too much information. You can still recover the total weight of the original problem by, solve, by just looking at the mode of these randomly projected problems. Are we going to formalize the notion of simpler? Uh, less degrees of freedom, less variables, basically. Every constraint removes one degree of freedom. So it brings down the entropy. That's sort of one way to think about why the eye projection, why the approximation works. So the way intuitive way to think of it is that this random projection simplifies the model and preserves the, the key properties. So now, how are we going to use this? How much time do I have? So how are we going to use it with the variational inference? Remember, the basic idea is that we start with p, and we want to project it down to some tractable family. And in general, this uh, KL divergence can be very large. So it might not, the approximation might not be good. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to first take a random projection by adding disparity constraints. And then we're going to take an I projection. So we're going to solve this. We're going to find the best approximation of the randomly projected model using this tractable family. And the intuition is that if. How many constraints do you need for the random projection? Good question, yeah. So I'm sort of glossing over it. You need to find the right number, as usual. Uh, the, the key thing here to note is that if Q, this family, is sufficiently expressive in the sense that it contains all degenerate probability distributions. So all probability distributions that put all the probability mass in one point. Like, think of it Dirac deltas kind of, kind of things. Then you, you can sort of see why this approximation should work well, right? Because before, we were approximating the random projection, the randomly projected model, just by looking at the mode of the distribution, just with a single point, right? Before, when we were doing this approach, we were Every time we would just apply, let's see if I have it, we would apply a, pro a projection and then find a mode. So we would just look at a single state with the highest probability. Now, well, now you, as you can imagine, you can always recover that approximation by choosing one of these degenerate distributions that put all the probability mass at one point. 
But if your tractable family is even larger, then your approximation can all get worse. Like if you're finding the optimal approximation, and if indeed the optimal approximation was to choose just a single point, you can always do it. But by looking at a larger set, the larger set of options, the approximation can only improve. Yeah? Do you, do you just have the degenerates, or do you have, say, all finite combinations of them? Because that's the structure of these projections, right? It's, it's a finitely supported set, and if you do enough projections, you might have a small number, and then there is no high projection. It would be exact. Yes, but then the variance could be huge. All right. So we always want to control the variance. We want to get something that works with high probability. So we just need the, the extreme states. So then basically the algorithm works like before. What you do is you repeat a small number of random projections, and then you find the corresponding I projection, and then you aggregate. And you can show that this will give you a well, a, a good approximation with high probability if you choose carefully the, the right number of parity constraints to add, basically. Uh, what's the advantage of this? The advantage is that, as we said, basically this random projection preserves a lot of the information, so we don't lose much by doing that. And the advantage of our previous approaches is that now this approximation here, this variational optimization problem, is actually a continuous one. Yeah. So just to understand, let's say that my original distribution was the uniform distribution of the satisfying assignments of a CNF. Yeah. How does this work? So what does the first step do and what does the second step do? Uniform, so you would basically add. Yeah. I just want, in some sense, my distribution is. Yeah. Yep. Solution of a CNF so it would work very similarly to the standard model counting thing, except that at every step, instead of checking satisfiability, you would try to solve this variational optimization problem. But what I'm asking is, what is the final result that I get? Uh, in terms of approximation, yeah, what, what should it look like? Uh, it will, if you can do it, which it, I mean, I'm gonna come to the, what is the catch because there is no, of course, there is no magic. But ideally, it would find you. In that case, it will find you one. Uh, satisfying assignment, and it will put all the probability mass on that one. And then you would take a mixture of those, is that right? Each drawn roughly independently, right? Uh, well, y you do need a few of them just to get statistical guarantees. Yeah. Did you have any closure conditions on the set of trackable distributions? I mean, you just say you have the extreme ones, but nothing in between? I mean, uh, no, it just has to be, like, what we use is mean field. So fully factor distributions, which includes the, the degenerate ones, for example. That's basically the only one we've played with in practice, which is one that people use often also. But the, the final aggregation step is sort of like you are closing in some sense at that stage. You are scaling up more. Like, like you're sort of getting a median and then scaling up. So it's the same aggregation as what we were doing before. But I guess the, the key point I wanted to make here is that this optimization problem is now a continuous one. We don't have combinatorial optimization anymore. This is an optimization problem over probability distributions. And so you can find some parameterization of those, and you're solving a continuous optimization problem. So for example, if we look at mean field, where the approximating family is fully factored, then we get a randomly projected mean field problem which uh, is nice in the following sense. It's coordinate-wise concave. So if you fix all the variables except for one, and that variable is concave, so you can sort of do uh, coordinate ascent uh, methods, or you can look at gradients. You can do all sort of interesting things on that objective. It has less variables, which is also nice. The challenge is that it's still non-convex. So this is the catch. This is where there is no free lunch. Finding the best approximation, the best mean field approximation, and it is a non-convex optimization problem. So in general, we are not going to get guarantees. Uh, we really don't know how to solve non-convex optimization problems. But if you have a way to find the global optimum, if you can really find the best approximation, then you get good accuracy guarantees. And then it becomes an empirical thing of actually finding that. How much time? I'm out of time. Zero? OK. Sounds good. Just show you. It does work well in practice. Like, see, if you compare it to plain mean field, you can get maybe 500 orders of magnitude improvements by using 
uh, these kind of random projections. It works on these kind of deep learning models. You can get better, uh, more accurate estimates of, of partition function with respect to mean field. You can use it to learn uh, generative models. So you can use it in these complex models where you have neural networks that sort of generate the data, and you use other neural networks to sort of specify the approximating family. And use it, and it works well. Like you can learn models, you can do denoising, and uh, well, other kinds of random projections. I'm going to skip this part, and just conclude. Oops. So yeah, hopefully I convinced you that uh, you know uh, you can use random projections for probabilistic inference. They've been used a lot in information retrieval, machine learning, to speed up uh, a lot of useful tasks. And I think you can, but it's it's very exciting to look at ways to use them in probabilistic inference and learning. You can come up with new algorithms with provable guarantees and then improve practical performance. And there are very exciting applications in machine learning, like learning generative models of data in an unsupervised way. Thank you. Actually, I have a question. Sure. So how important is it to, to choose um, 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 parity functions with, with many variables? Why can't I choose a parity function with just three, three variables or four variables? Why, so, not one? Why not one? Make life easier. Maybe I'm just one, yeah. So if you do one, what you get is you, you can get an unbiased estimator. So if you do with one and you repeat it a very large number of times, you can get your right answer. The problem is that what we want here, we always want to only do it a small number of times. We want to control the variance. So and, and if you, in your variance, is there, is there a parameter that uh, is the number of, of XOR variables? variables? Yes, yeah, so you can. it turns out you can control the variance. Uh, as a function of how long the parity constraints are. And it turns out you can actually get shorter than n over 2. You can actually get some kind of guarantees even using non-parity functions. That's the kind of thing I skipped. But we have an ICML paper where we show what you can do if you start with any kind of circuit, your favorite circuit here, and then you build a hash function by basically randomly wiring the inputs into the circuit and randomly choosing an output. So we have a way to sort of analyze how well this will work as a hash function. It turns out that the key property is something called the noise sensitivity. It has something to do with Fourier spectrum of the function. But you can work out how well they will work in more general cases. Other questions? Yes, please. So I suppose it's something standard, but can, instead of using random parameters, can you use like error no correcting codes to get it to match? Uh, that's Dimitris. <laughs> he has a paper on using error correcting codes. Yeah. Yeah. Empirically, if you would compare which shooter, which does the and, uh, MBE exactly, with this gives us an approximate. Uh, with, what happens if you compare these two? So things? if you can get the MPE exactly, then you get a better. You get, yeah, you might as well go for There's that. A between the number of samples you do, in both cases, one needs more time, one is more approximate, and what's so the, the advantage is that you get no, you get a continuous optimization problem. That's the way I see it. And you can plug in neural networks, and you can do interesting things. Uh, like you can use amortized inference. You can do like where you sort of using, uh, you can sort of store the computations that they've done in the pre as you learn a model. You can sort of use the computation that you have done in coming up with a good approximating family over and over. And you can sort of train at the same time a generative model and a good recognition network that will basically come up with a good approximation for the posterior. So that's the key advantage. So you can sort of plug it in into some of the almost well, state-of-the-art architectures to learn these generative models of images and data. So going back to my questions, in the experiments, how do you decide how many extra constraints to add? So in the experiments, we actually, uh, let me see. In the, in the generative models, we just picked a number that was showing uh, sort of like in cross-validation, picking a number that worked well. Uh, in the RBM, I think we did an exhaustive search, and we found the one that was that was giving the best bound. If you just choose numbers, and you cannot say anything about guarantees. We cannot say anything, anyways, because of the you, we can get lower bounds. The problem is that if there is a non-convex optimization problem, and we don't know how to get a certificate of optimality, so the only thing we can get are lower bounds, and we still get the lower bounds with the short parity constraints or a fixed number of parity constraints. So if I understand correctly, uh, you showed us a way how to 
approximate the value of the uh, log likelihood at a certain theta. Uh, but your real goal is to optimize over theta. Yeah. So if you're using this as a subroutine in, say, a gradient descent, uh, perhaps adding, having a noisy estimate may make the gradient descent problem harder. Uh, so yeah. does that, do you see any of that in practice? Or? In practice, it works. So this is like a learning a variational autoencoder where you have basically random noise fed through a neural network that produces images. And then you use another neural network to sort of come up with an approximation for the posterior, taking the image as input and coming up with the parameters. And then you do the random projection at that step a bunch of times, and you use that to, to basically as an another, another approximation for the marginal likelihood. And it works better than without. Like if you do denoising, this is what you get without the random projection. This is what you get with the random projection. So here the task is sort of like I give you a corrupted digit, and you try to reconstruct it. And there are a few examples where the standard model doesn't work. Like a three is completed to a nine, and our thing actually gives you a three, which sort of indicates that it's doing a better job. We are running out of time, so let's thank the speaker. And <laughs> resume at 11.10.